few people in the front in sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. Okay. Great, everybody, ready to get started. Uh, thank you all for coming out. This is uh, a discussion hosted by us, the ECFR, the European Council on Foreign Relations, and we're very happy and privileged to be joined um, by all of you, our distinguished guests in the audience, and also the eminent personalities on this topic um, joining us here on the panel. We are going to be speaking uh, here for one hour. Um, you'll hear from myself making the opening, then from Karis Jorna, Francisca Bratna, and Kunduns in turn. There'll be time for some questions. We'll make sure to leave some time for that at the end. Uh, and then anyone who didn't quite get the opportunity to make their intervention, save it. We'll have time to discuss further over the coffee break. We're doing this online. It's being streamed. So there's an audience following us uh, from outside. And that, by default, also makes it on the record, just so everybody is clear. OK, very good. Let me just start briefly by, by framing um, why we as the European Council on Foreign Relations are looking at this issue of critical raw materials. Um, so for those of you who know us, the ECFR, you might find the minerals and rare earths on the one hand uh, and foreign policy and geopolitics on the other make for strange bedfellows. It's not an immediate connection. But securing CRMs, as they're known, is shaping up to be a hotly contested global scramble. CRMs act as the material bedrock for green technology, harnessing and storing renewable energy, as well as multitude of materials requisite for digitization. So driven by tectonic shifts in global energy supply from fossil to renewable, then doubled up with longer term needs driven by increasing digitization, CRM uh, demand is poised to skyrocket. In Europe, we're understandably preoccupied with energy security at the moment, but the demands of digitization and the exponential expansion of CRM consumption bear minding as well. Supply scarcity sets the stage for sharpening geopolitics. Then it's the competition and cooperation dynamics around that limited supply that will shape the geopolitics of CRMs, which is what we're interested in discussing today. While it's the supply pinch of the energy transition that makes Europe immediately vulnerable, the flip side is that CRMs are also ultimately the key to Europe's energy security and economic resilience. If we get it right, we'll diversify Europe's energy supply, learning the lesson of Russian single supply, and dramatically advance Europe's leadership on global climate objectives. But to do that, Europe will need to navigate the geography of geopolitical competition and play catch up in terms of its capabilities. To map that geography may be useful to conceive of CRMs in a broader industrial trajectory. There's the CRM mining, processing, refining phases, essentially getting the minerals out of the ground and refined to put them to the point where they can turn into things that we can build from. There are nuances that this elides, but for the purposes of argument for this presentation, let's label this the supply phase. Then higher up the manufacturing chain, there's production. So building the components essential to green technologies and digitization. A geopolitical strategy for Europe needs to treat these phases as distinct because in each phase, different competition and cooperation dynamics emerge. Europe's allies in the supply phase can be competitors in the production phase. So while we need a gesamt concept, if you'll allow me, because we're here in Berlin, an overall strategy that needs to be designed according to the phases, since these will dictate Europe's variable relations to allies and competitors. That gesamt concept might be conceived of as a life cycle strategy of CRMs. To illustrate this concept, Europe's relations to the US and China aptly demonstrate the shifting dynamics across the supply and production phases. In the supply phase, China is still in a march, not only on Europe, but also Europe's like-minded allies, including the US. A legacy of outsourcing a quote-unquote dirty industry to the global south 
and a relic of an era where the market could be relied upon to secure supplies. For example, out of the 30 critical raw materials currently considered critical, 19 are predominantly imported from China. Moving up the manufacturing chain to the production phase of green technologies, Europe has long felt itself a global market leader. But here, China is advancing steadily, while the US is positioning itself to be a strong competitor to Europe. Looking at solar, much of the solar photovoltaic and manufacturing chain today is geographically con concentrated in China. And in polysilicon production, seven of the top 10 manufacturers are Chinese, with US, EU, Japanese, and South Korean companies accounting for only 22% of the global total. In wind, European manufacturers remain competitive. The EU, for instance, is the global leader in exports of wind turbine generator sets. But in other segments, China is more dominant, accounting for more than half of the world's wind turbine manufacturing and assembly plants. And finally, in the production of batteries, China accounts for more than 60% of the global production of cathodes, anode separators, and electrolytes, all of which are components of battery cells. China also accounts for nearly 80% of global battery cell manufacturing capacity. Turning to the US now on the other side, it's upping its game on production to compete with China with its new Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA. Using its market strength, much as the EU utilizes the single market as regulatory power, the US is creating a vacuum effect via subsidies incentivizing industry to re relocate to the US. That effect is so pronounced that it risks driving European deindustrialization and green technology as industry relocates to the US. The effect of the IRA is immediate and its impact is already being felt. In the midterm, the US IRA also impacts the supply phase we talked about earlier by creating incentives for CRMs to be sourced by US free trade agreement partners. But the competition cooperation dynamics here are not set in stone yet. There's room to shape them. Applying the CRM life cycle strategy, even only to US and China cooperation and competition, we can draw some initial conclusions. In the supply phase, there's a potential cooperation with the US to offset Europe's dependence on China. And there's already a vehicle for that cooperation. That's called the Mineral Security Partnership. But bearing in mind uh, the US IRA's medium-term implication for drawing supply of CRMs into the US market orbit, that space needs to be watched. The production phase clearly contains a competitive element with the US IRA, as well as the already known rivalry with China. So here Europe needs to avoid being caught in a pincer between these two great powers. But the CRM life cycle strategy can be applied beyond the great powers and will need to be because the natural conclusion is the need for Europe to diversify its partnerships and build up its capacities. So as Europe approaches these new partnerships, a similar cooperation competition calculation can be employed, ensuring those partnerships remain consonant with that gesamt concept that I described at the beginning. With that, let me close my opening. Uh, and start moving to the panelists. Each of the panelists here is leading different parts of Europe's approach to CRMs. So there's no one better to provide an insight into the state of Europe's CRM supply and what Europe can and is doing to advance its CRM diplomacy. That also brings us to the logic of this panel, uh, constituted originally um, as a mixture of the EU member states, the EU presidency, uh, Sweden, who has had to apologize at the, at the last minute for not being here, but had every intention of joining us, and leading uh, EU departments developing the EU's Landmark Critical Materials Act. Each, I think, shares an investment in creating a cooperative pan-European approach to this topic. So allow me then with that uh, to hand over the floor to Kerstin Jornas, the Director General for the Directorate General for Internal Market Industry, Entrepreneurship, and SMEs, which is a bit of a mouthful, so most people call it DG Grow. Uh, over to you, Kirsten. Thank you very much. You might uh, want sorry. to take a microphone and you just switch yeah. Say, yeah. We are missing a critical raw material here. 
Um, thank you very much. I want to do a different Gesamtkonzept okay. because my perspective is different. <clears throat> my perspective is the business case. And I'd like you to imagine a triangle. On one corner, you have industry needs. On the second corner, you have raw material deposits, but they're not where the industry is and the European industry in any event. And then on the third corner, you have refining. And I'll say a word on these three in a second. Until, you know, two years ago, maybe three years ago, uh, before the crisis, the inside of the triangle was of no concern to policymakers. It was globalization and a business case. That is changing. And that is why we have the conversation. So inside, you still have the business case, but you also have single market policy, you have European diplomacy, and you have European development uh, policy. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. So going back to the, um, to, the four, uh, to the three angles, the needs angle. There is the fabulous five of minerals that are really relevant for the green and the digital transition. It's zinc, it's copper, it's aluminium, it's nickel, it's lithium. And then there are the two indispensable ones, which is rare earth, everything doing to do with mobility, it's the magnets, and cobalt. Now compared to our baseline today and what we use, our industries use, there will be an enormous increase in demand. Um, 11% for, for zinc, 35% uh, for copper, same for aluminium, lithium 3,500% until 2050. And on rare earth, depending how you define and which type of rare earth, between 600% and 2,500% uh, as we move on, cobalt 330%. So increase in demand. And unfortunately for us, it's not only in Europe, it's everywhere. So there will be a scramble, I think you called it, for raw materials um, in, uh, in the future. And if we don't have them, we don't have energy. And if we don't have energy, we don't have an industry. And if we don't have an industry, we don't have welfare and, uh, in, in Europe. So it's important to, um, to look at that. Then when I look at the deposits, um, there are deposits inside. The EU. It's a pity our Swedish colleague couldn't join mm -hmm. because there are quite some deposits in Sweden and they are actually doing quite amazing job about them. Um, and uh, but most of it, uh, they will always have to be from outside as well. So how do we get access to the raw material deposits outside the EU? Where again we're not the only ones interested in those. And then I come to the refining. Um, we do some refining in Europe, and that's important because. If ever we wanted to recycle as one of the solutions, uh, we have to understand how to refine. So we need refining as a business case in Europe as well. But for rare earth, for example, 98% is in China. So that's another dependency. Now, how do we make sure that the business case for our industries uh, is maintained? And I will speak in particular on the single market. Uh, because that's where it starts. We are currently developing a Critical Raw Materials uh, Act, uh, which is due for publication in uh, next March. And that <coughs> act will have four pillars. The first pillar is mapping and monitoring. Because, um, first of all, we need a list. What is critical? Uh, we have many lists today, and investors say, you know, you know, what is now really critical? So we need a European list. We also need to map what we have. And I mean mapping below the surface, because a lot of the mapping actually happened in the 50s and 60s, and we were not looking for what we're looking today. Mm -hmm. So update. And we have to work together, um, uh, the different agencies in the member states for this. The other is also mapping above the ground, which is, in fact, the tailings, because there is no mapping of tailings. And the tailings of extractive activity in Europe today contain a lot of the, uh, I mean, speaking about rare earth or cobalt, uh, the, 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 the minerals that we actually need. So we have to also look at that. This is important 
uh, to have this uh, visibility for building also future business cases. Um, and of course we have to monitor and we have to be able to find solutions when we monitor that there is a shortage. Uh, and maybe there will be uh, also comments on that. Then the second pillar is um, the permitting and the standards. We need a level playing field in Europe, um, both for extraction but also for uh, permitting and, uh, and how to extract, how to restore, how to build these business cases that's important for investment and we need to a single market approach, not different, uh, different approaches in different countries. Um, the third pillar is investment signaling. All of this will require investment and we need to identify the most strategic of these uh, projects to, uh, to showcase them also for, uh, for de-risking, public de-risking and, uh, and private funding as well. And then there is a, what are, all these three pillars were about supply, but I think we also have to talk about demand. And demand is the off-takers, it's the industry. It's those who produce cars and need uh, uh, metal alloys, for example, uh, who, need, who need batteries, materials for the cars. And um, how do we bring the off-takers in? One way would be to oblige them to diversify not only have one source, or source the cheapest and maybe the most dirty material from somewhere, but to have diversification obligations, which would contribute also to business cases in more sustainable mining operations. And then, um, so these were the four pillars. And then, of course, we also need a strategy, a European strategy, not every member state for themselves, for um, accessing Material, raw materials uh, outside the EU. Um, so that would be the package. Now, quickly, diplomacy and development. Um, diplomacy, there are cooperations with like-minded countries. You already mentioned the, uh, the MSP. Um, there's, of course, work also in other uh, G7, uh, the trilateral platform. Um, and then on development, and, and Kuhn will talk about that, is the global gateway that brings together the, the, the kind of uh, the different partners. And I want to make uh, finishing one example of how it works, Namibia. So Namibia, we have a memorandum of understanding uh, on the raw materials. We have uh, the EIB as a European actor coming in with uh, sovereign loans uh, and also loans to companies wanting to be active. We have the Commission coming in with uh, uh, skills, Erasmus Plus and Horizon money to support. Uh, we have we are supporting it, uh, 47 million from uh, from EFSD. We also are supporting sector reform, uh, 4 million. In order, and this creates an investment case and a business case for, um, for working uh, in Namibia and uh, securing access for off-takers in Europe for Namibia. So this is the bridge of the global gateway where the alignment of these interests can take place. And, uh, and I think raw materials is, is one of the very concrete applications and examples that we have. Thank you. Thank you, very concise. And I, I neglected to mention in my introduction that DG Grow has been working on this from the very early days of the issue. So that was very evident. Um, there's some water on the way for <laughs> thirsty panelists and speakers. I'm sure it'll be brought any second now. Um, but let me turn to our second speaker, Francisca Brunner, who needs no introduction, but all the same, she's the Parliamentary State Secretary at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. And I'm hoping she's going to share with us a little bit about Germany's internal strategizing uh, on CRMs and perhaps shed some light on views towards the U.S. IRA. Yeah, thank you and good evening from my side. Um, and it's a pleasure sitting here together with you, um, you know, because you just said we have been working on this before it became the headlines in all the newspapers. <laughs> um, because uh, it's an evident case of uh, yeah, where we need to react and, and become more active. Um, and I would like to add um, to the business case that you know, sometimes in the debate you have the question, is a more proactive 
raw material policy by governments, be it at the European level, national level, in the end more costly for companies because it drives up the prices, because we set criteria, standards, and you know we get more active, or is it uh, cheaper for governments, uh, for companies? And we have done, uh, or it's uh, EY that has done a very substantive study, and it has compared over decades um, companies' price for raw materials in countries that have an active raw material policy and those that don't. And in comparative countries, I'm like, we didn't take Namibia and Germany, but South Korea, Japan, the US, um, EU member states. And the interesting result is that it is cheaper for companies if their governments have an active raw material policy. Um, and I think that is really an important lesson that the prices are much more stable um, and lower when their respective governments do pursue an active raw material policy in terms of uh, diversification goals, in terms of a fund, uh, you know, investing together with companies and stockpiling. Uh, and that for us was quite important to see that uh, um, there is not just the overall interest of our society to become less dependent, which I think is a strategic objective we all share among companies and the governments, but also from a governmental side. But there's also a business case to, um, to having a more active policy there. And, and I think that uh, we have seen over the last year uh, that dependencies can have a very high price and that financial markets start to count price that in as well. Rating agencies are looking much closer at the geopolitical risks in companies' um, policies. Um, and I think that we have to be there um, ready to, uh, you know, to support this and do this at the European level and international with our partners. Uh, we, you mentioned the U.S. Raw Material Pact. Um, so we have uh, a cooperation that even goes beyond Europe. Um, but of course, the EU is for us the key actor to start with. And that's why we um, have uh, already prepared a German-French paper giving input uh, to the European um, process of defining the European Raw Material Act. And I think it was important to signal this that we really have complete alignment between the French side and the German side on this issue. We, there are many issues we disagree these days. Um, so <laughs> on energy, it's much more complicated. Um, but we really have uh, alignment on this question. And I think that you know this is also good news um, for some actors <laughs> that have to otherwise deal with differences. And what is it about? Basically, it's saying that um, we have to diversify in terms of outside, but also at home. That's what uh, you have also mentioned. We also have part of it, part of the resources inside Europe. Not all, never sufficient. I'm like, even if we use all the raw materials we have within the EU, we won't be... Uh, so self-sufficient. So we need to diversify abroad at home, but do this with high standards, environmental standards and um, social standards, because I think otherwise back home it won't be acceptable, and abroad we won't get access, because then they stay with the Chinese, if I can be very blunt. Um, so if we do not add, for example, that we bring technologies that use less water, destroy less the environment, um, then we are less of an interesting partner. And then you have the second part, which I think is very important, is that we do get into a circular economy on many of the materials we have been speaking about, which we don't have yet. And that needs also uh, you know, support, speeding up of permitting, there's a lot behind it, setting norms, standards, when does something stop being waste, when does it become a new uh, material. So there are many questions that we have to figure out in this area. Um, and then there's this area of substitution research and efficiency research where we can do a lot 
uh, to reduce our needs for the raw materials in the first place. And and how does this fit together with the uh, with the IRA with the American approach? The American approach is compatible with ours in terms of saying we need to diversify and we need to get less dependent. And I think that's a very much shared objective between the US and us. Um, that we know that we need to keep the production capacity for the green transformation also at home, not completely. I, w I think it would be wrong to say we do it all now at home, but to also have production capacity and diver diversification when it comes to raw materials. So that's first, I think, good news that we have also in terms of objectives, alignment with, the, with our Western partners. And then, of course, the question is, so does this exclude the Europeans or not? Um, what is an FTA? Does it include Europe? Uh, because in the IRA specification on minerals, it is the limit to FTAs, uh, which we don't have. But Canada, Mexico, Chile. Um, so in a way, it will also help diversification. Also for us, in terms of, you know, Getting investments into Chile and uh, Mexico overall is good. Um, but we have to make sure that we don't fall out of the picture. And I've been very happy to hear what um, President Macron uh, achieved during his pre uh, visit in, uh, in Washington, that President Biden afterwards was saying that we will find a joint approach. And I think that's what we have to work out now. There is a task force where the commission is sitting. It's not us as member states, but it's the commission. But of course, we give input. and. Um, I think you know it was good that President Macron obviously got something being in Washington, and it's good for all of us. And now we have to work it out. I think we, what I wish we could do is really to make partnerships with many countries so that they can become partner of us in creating the green value chains of the future. That's what we can put to the table. It's an offer and say, let's make these green value chains together. Um, not just inside the EU, not just inside the US, but with you know our partners worldwide. I want this to be an opening, uh, turning to the world, saying let's make this transformation work together and everybody can share in and have part of the value um, along the chain. And some are afraid that it's a zero-sum game in terms of you know what we get, the US doesn't, what the US gets, we don't, or then doesn't go to Chile. I think we need so much for the transformation worldwide that our first worry should be to get it done everywhere and not so much worrying about who gets too little because the challenges are enormous. Um, if we want everybody to only drive E or if we want everybody to just have renewable energy worldwide, we will need a lot of production capacity. So I think let's not make this a zero-sum game worldwide, but one of partnerships. Um, and I think that could also geopolitically help. Thank you so much, Francisca. I'm sure we'll pick up on quite a few of those points in the question and answer. And for you in the audience as well, uh, bear in mind if you have a question, get it chambered at this point, because um, after our next speaker, I'll open, I'll open the floor. So yeah, now to, to close us out on this very first set of interventions, um, lucky to have Kun Duns with us, Director General from the Director General of International Partnerships, which is also known as INFA. Kun, over yeah. to you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Theo. Uh, really, really good to be here with all of you, with Kerstin, with uh, Francesca. And um, I mean, as, as you've laid it out uh, just now, basically we're looking for diversification of supply chains in a competitive world on a topic where uh, very soon um, uh, demand will outpass um, the the offer. Um, so that's fun. Uh, that's <laughs> geop that's geopolitics, uh, and that's to a certain extent indeed what I'm I'm dealing with as director general for international partnerships. I mean the the art formerly known as a development cooperation, uh, but we've dropped that label of development cooperation and for good purpose because I think that. Uh, if we if 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 we are acting now in in the context as uh, as just described, what will absolutely be essential is the way in which indeed we engage with partners across the globe, and then notably uh, in the global south, uh, to basically create a a meeting of minds uh, which flows from 
a meeting of interests. Uh, in, in the multipolar world, many of our partners are, uh, are taking their own decisions, are making their own choices, uh, and they have multiple partners from which to choose. And so what will be important for Europe is indeed to come up with an offer um, that uh, creates that kind of meeting of interest, that actually makes what we put on the table attractive for partners uh, in, the global, in the global south. Uh, that's true for critical raw materials, that's true for a number of other issues um, as, as well, and that's why we have a uh, global gateway, which is exactly uh, the attempt to do just that, to see how can we come up uh, with something that is more attractive than what partners can get from, uh, from, from others. Um, I mean, reference has been made to the, uh, to the Namibia case, and I, I think it's a, it's a nice example indeed. It's not the only one, but it's probably a nice one to illustrate what we are trying to do. Uh, and that is to come up uh, with a package that uh, for sure combines a, a whole set of players on the European side, uh, member states, development finance institutions, uh, grant funding we can come, uh, come up with, the private sector obviously, and so on, to, to, to offer to our partner countries a strategic partnership that ultimately is beneficial for them as well. And we've gone through many, many months of negotiations uh, with, um, with our Namibian uh, partners. Um, and the, the interest of what we bring is that this is not just about the extraction of raw materials. Uh, it is linked to a much broader um, uh, package, um, linked as well to a whole ecosystem, where we are indeed looking not just at the CRM part, we're looking at energy and the whole partnership on uh, green hydrogen. We are looking at um, transport corridors, strategic corridors that link up while this buy over Windhoek to, uh, to, to Maputo. We are looking at port development, uh, which is critical also from, a, from an infrastructure point of view between Namibia uh, and Europe. We are looking at capacity building of the Namibian state. We're looking at the regulatory frameworks with indeed the highest possible norms and standards. We're looking at value addition in Namibia itself so that there's a real interest um, for economy, for jobs, for growth in Namibia. We're looking at training people, and that's both at tertiary level uh, with, uh, with, with Erasmus Plus and, and Horizon Europe, and technical and vocational education and training. So what we are basically in the market of offering is a package of high standards that covers a 360 degree approach, so the full ecosystem. And what we have seen is that if we go if we go and approach our partners with that kind of package, that actually they see the interest of engaging with us. And I'm giving that example because it typifies the approach which we want to follow under Global Gateway as we develop these partnerships uh, with, uh, we are with partners, whether they're in Central Asia, in Latin America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, this is the approach uh, we want to follow. That comes obviously with a number of, of challenges. These are complex packages that can only be designed and only be borne by uh, what we now call, in our jargon, uh, Team Europe. So a multitude of players on uh, the European side. That's probably a distinction with some of the other um, partners we're, uh, we're, we're competing with, we're cooperating with or competing with, depending on the, the degree of, uh, of intensity, uh, which somehow can be uh, more monolithically organized, we are, we are more complex, uh, but we also believe, I think, in the power of that complexity, the power of, of the team, if you can make the team play as, uh, as a team, as maybe a comparison to make with the, uh, the World uh, Football Championships uh, that are ongoing. And this is the, the main effort we are doing now, is how can we set up a, an, an organizational way of working that brings member states, private sector, DFIs and so on, to come to bear and build these kind of packages that are attractive for partners. Thank you very much for that, uh, Kuhn. I, th I think you preempted and anticipated one, one of the questions I'm sure that will come, which is, 
uh, does Europe have a competitive offer uh, to make? And even if we're not, if we're trying not to think in zero sum terms, I think it is important that we have as Europe the, the, the capacity and the ability to make a compelling offer to our partners while we then use that as a basis for, for cooperation. Um, that brings us again to the conclusion of the first interventions. If you would like to ask a question, you just put your hand up and somebody will place the microphone in your hand. Um, if some of you need to think about that a little bit more, um, I'll indulge my privilege as a chair in one of the questions that I had wanted to ask anyway. If, if we could, maybe we could also indulge ourselves here in an exercise of positive visualization. We've heard about the steps that are being taken. We understand the Global Gateway can be an important vehicle. Just think here a little bit outside the box. Let yourself run free. Is there a tool or a capacity that you wish that the Commission had or, or Francisca that you wish here in Germany as a member state that we had that we do not yet have? If you had absolutely free reign and could imagine something new that would really take us light years ahead in terms of our approach. Um, is there something that you would care to, to speculate and throw out there? <laughs> it's an easy one. You all seem to be looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Um, no, actually, I, I, I think, honestly, I think that um, I think that most of the tools we need um, are there. Um, I think the real challenge is is an organizational one. It's like, I mean, when, when you're in a kitchen and all the ingredients and tools are there, it doesn't mean you're capable of cooking uh, the, the best dish. Uh, and I think that that's the phase uh, we, we are in. When, when we've been talking to uh, to various actors, to partners, to the private sector, uh, to the banks, and so on. I don't see any any um, any missing tools in our toolbox. Is how can we create the necessary focus to make all of that deliver on our real priorities? And that's where it ends, and that's where it starts. Um, but I do think that we have what it takes to engage in that kind of, let's say competitive cooperation. Yes, to put it nicely. Uh, there's a question here on the far left, so. Yes, thank you so much. My name is Christian If you could just wait for the microphone, then people who are outside the room. Uh, thank you very much. It's a very interesting panel. Thank you. Uh, I'm Christian Hanold. I'm the expert for the Middle East, North Africa region, the southern neighborhood of the EU. And my question is, if Namibia is an example and very well explained, but geographically far away, is any country in the neighborhood, from your analysis, an example country for that uh, paradigm of cooperation we have, for example, Morocco, with the so-called Green Partnership? Or does this go beyond Namibia, I would like to ask you? Or, uh, or do we have to upgrade countries in the neighborhood to be a good example and a good partner, which are geographically close, closer than Namibia, for example? Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Does anyone feel spoken to with that question? I don't have to look at Kuhn all the time. You know, it's not a question of proximity. It's a question of who has what kind of materials. Um, and North Africa is a great energy partner. And that's what we're working on. Um, you know, Tunisia might be one day phosphor, but it needs a lot of question around energy, etc. So it's more complicated. Um, uh, on the African continent, South Africa is very important. Um, we're in contact with them. My minister is just there now. Um, and it's about energy, but also, you know, it's uh, innovation, investment in general, but also raw materials, because they have, of course, a lot. Um, other countries are DRC. We all know it's more complicated. Um, but really, we have a lot of partners around the world that are close allies that have a lot of raw materials. Um, Canada, Australia, you know, South Africa, so Chile, Argenti Argentine, uh, Brazil. Um, so I always say we, <laughs> sometimes it's, you know, people do misunderstand it that it's the same as gas and that you're immediately landing with uh, the dictators of this world. 
when we're talking about raw material, it's actually not that bad. Um, there are many good partners out there. Like we just need to get investments and cooperation going. And, uh, and we have to be honest about it that, you know, investing in a mine there is, won't be as cheap as somewhere else. And, as, and if you go to refining, it's even more so. And that is rather the difficulty. Um, how do we make it competitive? And then we go about standards. Um, because otherwise we will be able to out-subsidize ourselves. Um, and our member states in the EU are financially stretched. Um, so we cannot do all via subsidies. And then you have to set criteria. Um, and they will make it competitive. But I think these are the questions we really need to talk about. So. I'm not worried in terms of the countries we need to work on. And if I had one wish, as you asked before, um, then for me, I wish I could have now this raw material fund where I could give companies or actors the, the funding to make a feasibility study, a bankability study, to take first risk, etc. So that would be great if I had it now, because there are many projects popping up and our companies have interest now, and I wish I could seize that moment. Um, and not have to tell them it will probably take a year until we have it up and running. If I might say a word, um, of course you mentioned the MENA region, but we have also closer by, we have Ukraine, we have Serbia. I mean, there are very relevant materials there. And if, I would argue, of course, it's better to be closer by than, you know, further away. Um, now, Ukraine is not actually, uh, it's very difficult at the moment, but I'm very hopeful that, you know, in the future we'll be able to pick up and we have an agreement with them. Uh, Serbia is also a very relevant uh, part, so uh, neighborhood, of course, has to be part. And my superpower would be, um, would be the alignment power, because everything we're talking here is aligning. And we've, in the past, there was policy and then there was economy, and, uh, and, you know, they didn't come together. What we now need is, is alignment and processes uh, for aligning public and private interest. In a previous life, uh, my alignment slogan was uh, private money for public good. Um, but we also need public money and public de-risking for private good to some extent uh, in, in, in what we're doing by allowing these projects and allowing sustainable access to raw materials. So it's the alignment tool. We haven't found the magic wand yet. I mean, it's called Industrial Alliance or it's called uh, Raw Materials Alliance. It's called uh, Global uh, Gateway. But uh, we, have to, uh, we have to be better. And I do agree with Kuhn that the fact that we are not one bag of money and one pair of boots, but more, mm -hmm. uh, will play in our favor, uh, united in diversity. That's our motto in Europe. Well said, well said. Can, can I ask um, each of you maybe to unpack a little bit what is contained under this term partners? Because I think if you hear it from far away without being inside the jargon, uh, it's, not, it's not exactly clear on this issue that, that, there's, a, that there's a distinction. Um, and as, as far as I'm reading it, but I could be wrong, there's two kinds, maybe there's more. Uh, there's a partner that helps us uh, fill a capability or a capacity that we're currently lacking. So it's a kind of long arm or force multiplication. And then there's partners um, in the foreign policy sense where we go out, make an MOU as we did with Namibia, and we look to basically work together on the resource that's hosted by that, by that partner country. Can you say a few words about that? Is that the right way to think about partnerships? Is it more complicated, less? Um, <laughs> well, it's it's um, <laughs> it's as complex as it can as it can get. Um, no, I mean wh what we mean by partners is basically as as I as I said earlier on. I think you you. We can look at the world from a, and, and that's what we're doing, from a European interest point of view. We look at our resilience, we look at our open strategic autonomy, uh, we look at a multipolar world where, where alliances are being designed and, and redesigned. Likewise, our partners, I mean, 
other countries, uh, to use a normal word, other countries in the global south, but not only in the global south, look at that same world, world in a very similar way, which is they have their interests, they have their issues at stake. They also need to create economic growth so that they can create jobs for their young people. They also see how the twin transition, digital and greening, will at the end of the day affect them. They have needs in terms of infrastructure investments and so on, and they are looking at partners across the globe, looking in a very sanguine way for who's going to give me the best offer. That's the world as it is now. So as we engage with countries, what we're trying to do is you can look at it from a, as Venn diagrams. You take ours with our interests, you take those of, of other countries with their interests. There's a space where these potentially overlap and where basically what we would like to do to serve our interests and what they need to serve their interests, where there's a potential synergy, a real convergence. That's the space where we want to be. I mean, it's not emotional. Um, international politics is not about emotions. It's about interest and convergence of, of interest. And that's, if we can build on that in a very mature way, then, then we're playing. And we see how the potential for those relationships, um, that the, the, the field for that is not diminishing. Actually, it is increasing. And it's increasing because the more and more partners look at us, the more and more we get our act together and can offer something that is interesting to partners, the more we are in the game. And what we sometimes consider, and I just want to pick up on a point Francesca mentioned uh, uh, earlier, the, the, we are a demanding partner, we're a complicated one. We come with lots of norms and standards and requirements. Our companies uh, have, have due diligence requirements and so on. But actually, that may sound, it may seem like a handicap um, when you're looking for a level playing field unless we can actually make that level playing field very demanding. And if we can come in and offer partners, work with partners, to something that ultimately will be much more beneficial for them than, let's say, the, the more cheaper, straightforward offers they can get from other partners, then we're playing the game. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. And we actually see the appetite for that increasing. So the question is not, do other countries, uh, as they look for partners, are they interested in what Europe has to offer or not? The answer is yes, they're interested. The bigger question is, therefore, is Europe capable of bringing that offer in, I mean, fast enough and in sizable enough terms? And that brings me back to my point on organizational alignment and so on. Uh, that's well heard. Francisco, did you want to come in as well? Very briefly, because I see there are other questions. I, you know, I think there is the situation that the demand is bigger than the offer right now. So those countries that can offer, they hedge, basically. And that's very normal. Um, and the added value, like we cannot bring cheaper. We can, you know, what can we bring to the table? We can bring better technologies. We can bring companies that know how to deal with local citizens. Um, and we can bring companies that are there usually for the longer term. Um, and this is not to be underestimated. Our problem is getting the investments now, making sure companies really do invest, because this is not just us sitting here and doing it. Without companies, we're lost. So this is the most important alignment, is between companies being ready to invest, us supporting it, and as I said, I wish we already had the financial instruments for that, but we have already aligned some of our financial instruments to include now raw material projects. And for example, Germany has already sent a list, a priority list for the Global Gateway, which is all government ministries you know, coordinated between development ministry, foreign affairs, us. Um, and I think that shows where we have prioritized. And it's not only raw material projects, but there are important raw material projects in it. And I think that's what we need, is to be fast on this line between companies and governments and within our and difficult systems sometimes. May I just say one example of alignment, maybe it's not known, but we have embedded EIB 
uh, colleagues in our delegations. So it's, you know, when a project comes, it's not only the, the diplomatic angle, it's also the finance angle, and it's the industry angle that come together in our delegations. And I think that's rather unique worldwide to have that combination. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I really like this idea, also what Kuhn mentioned earlier, that the, the standards and the regulations are a feature and they're not a bug, and that we need to be a little bit more self-confident in thinking about that as part of the offer. We're, we're coming quite close up to time, but a few hands had shot up. I think, Justin, you were there, so if someone could sprint a microphone to you, we'll get it in, but we're really near the last sort of five minutes. Thank you. So Justin Weiss, I'm the uh, Director General of the Paris Peace Forum. Um, so uh, my question is basically on, on, on China and the global governance of this whole sector, because it's great that we are putting uh, our European house in order uh, to compete and to raise the standards uh, at the same time, etc. But th the question is also, how can we get a more global, uh, because I think it's the genius of, of European foreign policy to, to also try to do global governance, right? Not just to compete in a scramble for resources, etc., but also to have uh, a larger view and organize uh, uh, things. And so my question is, uh, is there anything we can do uh, to convince other players, and I'm thinking of China in particular, because in that scramble, China has taken uh, a lead in, in refining, in putting its hands on uh, many resources, uh, uh, etc., in order uh, to uh, reduce the negative effects and externalities of the competition, uh, which lowers the standards, which makes everybody uh, try to get uh, new resources, etc. At the Paris Peace Forum, we had this call to action, this new multi-actor uh, uh, coalition that we formed a month ago on, on critical minerals, and, and we are trying to tackle that issue among others. But the question is, what can we do at that level of global governance? Thanks. Great. Thanks so much. And we can take a last question, but please make it pointed and succinct. We're, we're really close to time. All right, I'll just be, uh, I'll be quite quick. My name is Richard Diana from the Conic Support Unit uh, based here in Berlin. Just quickly, the role of trust. Um, I speak to a few friends uh, and colleagues in Africa. Uh, there is a real opening, I think, over the last number of months. They're not 100% sure uh, with regards to Europe's intentions, which I understand partially. And just curious, is this, is this potentially an opening? Um, and to, how would you try to abate this skepticism? Um, just quickly, this term leapfrogging. When Africans hear it, they just think somebody else is trying to sell me something. Um, just that's, of course, potentially also a fair point. But just your your thoughts about how um, obviously financing is one part, organization is another, coordination is another, but trust is arguably one of the largest soft factors in, in this entire discussion. Okay. Great. I think feel f feel free to, to choose from them as a buffet because we are we are quite close to time. Um, should we start on that end and work our way back, or did you want to go first? Um, sorry. Um, how to build trust? It's you know because we talk to partners, not to beneficiaries of our um, of our funds. Uh, and partners, I come back to my alignment. They have aligned interests. And if we can bring that alignment out in a good way, then there's also trust that both parties will be able to pursue this. Uh, the, uh, we bring off-takers um, that have technologies, that have a market for these, uh, and, uh, and they, uh, they are able to, and we are able to train uh, on you know, how we influence the global playing field, and that also creates trust. We have a great cooperation with the standard setting organizations, the international standard organizations, ISO and IEC, who are both relevant on standard setting for sustainable mining, for example. And uh, we're doing two things. We're making sure that the agenda of these organizations when it comes to uh, raw materials, that we have a very strong influence there because we have a lot of uh, countries in there. But we're also supporting a lot of projects to allow uh, countries that do not have such an elaborate standardization system as, as we have in Europe to actually catch up and be part of it and be part of these future uh, conversations. And we see a lot of buy-in for that. That also <coughs> creates trust. And uh, when it comes to the, the China question, 
is not only about the raw materials, and that's important to, to remember that it's also about the refining of it. And, um, and we must be able to keep our uh, refining know-how in Europe. Uh, it's very expensive at the moment because of the energy price, and that's why we have to really be careful about this. Um, but it's important for the, to see the whole value chain, not only the, uh, the raw materials, but also the refining. And then, because we have a lot of industrial knowledge on refining, we will also set the standards. And who sets the standard? As the market. So that's a big leverage we have. You know, I think your question um, assumes that there is competition. And the question is if competition is good. I wish there was competition. So far, there is none. Very, very little. I mean, like, basically, you have China in extraction and especially on refining. So my goal is to create competition. <laughs> and I would be happy if finally we would have competition. Um, and if you look at it right now, if we don't do something, there won't be a market where you can compete on. It will just be off-take agreements, refining there, so no competition. So all we're trying to do is to make sure there will be a market where you can compete. Um, and I think that's really, you know, analytically when you look at it, that's the, the starting point is there is no market uh, or very little. Um, and there won't, if we don't intervene now, there will be none in a couple of years. And that's the risk we're facing. And that's a geostrategic risk as much as an economic risk. And then if you say, you know, this competition will lower standards, no. They can't go much lower, to be frank. If you look at the way they're produced, oh my god, you know, they will not go lower. Because if we go in and start competing, we will raise standards. Um, so that's our offer. It's really the advantage we get. I'm like, whoever you speak to, be it in South Africa and Chile, wherever, Mongolia, whatever, what they ask is, can you bring the newest technology that we save water, that we can protect our soils, um, that we can include our indigenous people. Um, and that's the only added value we can bring that they're really interested in. So if we get competition, we will manage to raise standards. It's not a button to the a race to the bottom, it's the opposite. If we have no competition, we will have the lowest standards. Um, so I think we really have to make sure we're not ha having the wrong analytical frame looking at it. And then, of course, there's a question of what kind of international standards will work. There are several ones. Um, the highest, but it depends really on the material, is the IRMA standard, which is quite high. But we have to you know, hopefully agree with our partners that we have, in the end, one standard. And for example, Australia is leading in co coalition on norms and standard setting on what is um, sustainable mining, green mining so that we, in the end, will have um, joint standards. And uh, about the question, which I think is really interesting, about the trust building um, with our African partners, I think it requires a lot or like a strong reform of our trade policies, because so far our trade policies cut tariffs and customs for primary materials but not for refined um, in many of these areas we're talking about. Uh, and I think that if we want to really go and be trust building in terms of value creation, we have to show that we cut all tariffs and customs for refined products. Uh, and that will be a big, I think, move. Uh, but that's the trust I think we will have to bring to the table. And that was a national pricing for that and the local content rules accepted, etc. And that's still a no-go for many in trade to say, oh my God, this is, you know, you Ms. Brandner, you're crazy. I mean, like if we start accepting that they can have national pricing for their refining locally, um, then we will lose our trade um, ideology, I might say, yes. But we will win the raw material race and make countries be partners and be able to hedge. Because if we are not able to do this, we are not able to hedge. But that's a, you know, so we have to bring into this entire debate about the raw materials, we need to bring in the trade people. 
because so far the trade people are not thinking geostrategically in terms of raw materials and refining. Uh, maybe in terms of extraction, but not of refining. And that's what our partners are interested in. So um, I'm very happy that we managed to go in this direction with Chile. Um, finally, it was a lot of work to get done. Um, and that's what our African partners are asking for too. That's a long way still. So I, you know, I invite you next time to have trade people be part of it. Uh, because I know they're in front of me, <laughs> but at the panel. Um, so I think, you know, we really have to make sure that we can allow, because otherwise, if you, you know, refinement locally will not be competitive if you don't have national pricing for that. Um, so that will be the challenge for us to conceptually allow um, these partnerships for green value chains where our African partners will benefit. And that's the sine qua non for us to get a foot in. Very good, rousing. Kuhn, wrap us up. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad Sabine Bayant isn't here today. <laughs> 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 no, but to be honest, I mean, we, we work really, the, the, the three of us, I mean, Kerstin. Uh, I so, didn't so mean here, uh, her, uh, seriously, no, no uh, she is excellent. Very, 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 very strongly well. together. And I think, um, I mean, on, on global governance, absolutely nothing to add. I think you've, you've, you've said it all, and it's exactly that. That's also how we see it. Competition is what is lacking now, and that's what is needed. Uh, it's, it's not like it will disturb uh, peaceful global governance. It's quite the contrary. It's, it's uh, a competition that is needed if we want to create somehow a race to the top and not uh, get stuck uh, at, at the bottom where we are now. On trust, which I find a, a, a very, very good point. Um, I mean, it's, um, it takes a long time to build and it's easily, it's easily lost. And I think we've lost quite a lot of trust uh, with our African partners. And so it will take time to, to build it up. But as they say in, in, in French, il y a, a l'amour et puis il y a les preuves d'amour. And so I think that what we need is now les preuves d'amour. Uh, the way in which we, well, what we need to do to build up trust with African partners is actually to do things that show that we can be trusted. Is to show in reality, it's not just to walk, uh, to talk, it's actually to walk the talk and to produce real partnership that bring exactly uh, what, what you've just said, Francesca, this, this kind of benefits for Africa in Africa, and therefore value addition um, that creates the jobs, that creates the economic benefits for our African partners, uh, both within Africa and also indeed in terms of their exports to Europe. I think our trade regime uh, with, uh, with African partners is a, is a very, very uh, liberal one. And of the many LDCs that there are, they've basically got everything but arms, so duty-free, uh, quota-free. I think one of the challenges that many African partners have faced is actually to be able to use the potential of those trade agreements precisely because um, they, they are not um, producing all that much that would allow them to benefit from these trade agreements and actually partnering with them on making exactly that happen, the whole manufacturing part. I mean, I was just two weeks ago in Niamey um, when, uh, when the African Union had its uh, summit on, uh, on industrialization. And clearly, if we can position ourselves as being partners for Africa on industrialization, manufacturing, value addition, then I think we're starting to build trust again. And that's true for critical raw materials, but it's true for a whole swath of other uh, priority areas as well. Okay, two finger. Yeah, because I didn't want to be misunderstood um, in terms of, uh, because you mentioned your colleague who I've ex excellent work, uh, working um, relationship with, you know, uh, and I don't say it's just in terms of the commission. We have to think about how we, and it doesn't only address raw materials, it's also about coffee, yeah. you know, for example. And like that's the, the demand by uh, our African colleagues is um, cacao and, you know, cacao, coffee, you know, it's uh, in, in a way they are also mater raw materials. I'm like not in the sense we're talking today, uh, but this is what they're asking for. It's cacao, it's coffee, etc. cetera. And, and I think that we have to make sure that you know the people I'm talking to. They are also responsible for cacao and for <laughs> and for coffee. 
Um, and the proof will be coming also via what we're doing there. And it's often that I see that, you know, I want to talk to them about uh, cobalt and they say, okay, let's talk cobalt, but then let's talk coffee. Um, seriously, that's how it goes. Um, and if we are serious about the part about raw materials, we need to be serious about the value addition in coffee and cacao and whatever comes and rice and so. And uh, yeah, these are you know difficult discussions also on GSP plus and then we take rice away. So I just want to say that there we have to bring coherence in and that we cannot believe that in these countries you have the sectors and then we talk about value addition there and and then we don't see the rest and that's in that sense that i i and i don't think you know i didn't want to be misunderstood as a criticism i think it's as many member states who are arguing like this it's not the you know i'm like if it was just a commission it would be easy if i may say so but that's not the problem it's we have it in a, um it's a it's a real challenge to us as member states the commission to think it's through um on how we can create that trust and be, be uh, get a, a you know a foot in the door because we're not the first in line If I can just okay. add one thing, because I, I think the cacao one is a very good example of what we're trying to do. Of course, it's a very specific uh, commodity, um, but we're working now since two years with uh, uh, Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana. I mean, the two together represent 70% of the cacao production worldwide. We're now adding uh, Cameroon, but we've been having these talks with them, uh, together with, on our side, I mean, uh, the producers, the traders, um, uh, the, the whole works on, on the European side and uh, on, uh, on the African side. This is led by prime ministers and, and presidencies in, in Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire, where we precisely try to change the whole way in which this is done. Right now, they harvest the beans. Those beans are shipped, traded to us. All the value addition happens in trading and industrialization, so basically in Europe. And the smallholder farmers who harvest these beans get actually very, very little money for it, which in turn causes deforestation, causes child labor, and so on. And so we've been discussing now for two years, and this is shaping up very nicely in our cacao talks, a package where basically we focus on an increased price that we should pay for these cacao beans. And we've done market studies, <laughs> surveys, and actually the European consumer, uh, we're the biggest consumers of all of this, uh, the European consumer is absolutely ready to pay a higher price for its chocolate if indeed it's sustainably done. And so negotiations now are about how do we increase these terms of trade in exchange for stopping deforestation, in exchange for eradicating child labor, and in exchange for indeed addressing the living income differential so that these farmers get more money. And we're combining that with local production processes, part of it. I mean, it's not the idea that you produce chocolate in Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana and then ship it to Europe. I mean, it's hard to, to ship, but there's part of it that can be done uh, there. And so this is the whole approach that, that, that we are taking. It's a nice example. Uh, we, we're enormously appreciated. There's still a long way to go. Uh, but when I was in Côte d'Ivoire one month ago and, and I had a meeting with the Prime Minister, I mean, this is clearly something on which they are looking at Europe. And if we can deliver packages like that, then we'll start building trust. Thanks so much, Kuhn. I'm hearing between the lines uh, a plea to expand the critical materials list with one C. So we'll keep that in mind for the next time. We, we've if there was a common thread throughout this very rich discussion, and there was, a, there was a lot there, I think it was this term alignment. I kept hearing it over and over again. And I just wanted to say it's also foremost in our minds as ECFR in trying to craft a pan-European approach. That means between the member states and, and the commission. Um, and that was in evidence, or would have been in evidence here in the panel um, if circumstances hadn't intervened against us and kept our French and Swedish colleagues away. Um, also, we'll have a, another discussion today, later in the evening, where the important um, voice and inputs from those in the trade, particularly from DG Trade, will, will be brought to the table. So in our own modest way, we're trying to also lend a little bit of impetus to that objective. Um, with that, please, thanks. Uh, join me in thanking Kirsten Jorna 
Francisca Brunner, Kuhn Dunes, for being with us here today. Thank you very much.